Well, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the University Lectures Committee to the first of the fall lectures program. We are extremely fortunate to have as our first speaker Dr. Carl Sagan, Professor of Astronomy and Director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University. Dr. Sagan is widely known for his research on planetary atmospheres and surfaces, exploration of the planets by space vehicles, and the possibility and detection of extraterrestrial life. Dr. Sagan has published many scientific papers and authored several books in these areas. In its July 15th issue, Time Magazine named Dr. Sagan one of 200 rising American leaders. The subject of tonight's lecture, Life Beyond the Earth, is one which never fails to generate a spark in the minds of us that are involved in astronomical research. And I hope that Dr. Sagan will generate the same spark of curiosity in all of you tonight. Dr. Sagan. They've set a little intelligence test for me up here, which I am slowly failing. Thank you, Professor Grossman. I'm very pleased to be here in this, uh, I think it's the most beautiful auditorium I've seen in any college university campus. <laughs> Well, I'm here to talk about the possibility of life elsewhere than on this planet. And uh, let me begin by saying that no one knows whether there's life anywhere else but on this planet. And uh, therefore, I could make this an extremely short lecture. <laughs> but there are some hints here and there. and. Uh, the subject is one of great and historical interest to human beings. And uh, perhaps most interesting, we now have the tools to answer this question. For the first time in human history, we have at our command instruments which are able to really find out if there's life somewhere else. Up until this point in the history of the world, you could speculate on the subject. You could wonder. You could look up in the sky and ask yourself if there's anybody up there. But there was nothing you could do to find out. But uh, right now, we are in the throes of developing large radio telescopes, which have the capability to listen to possible signals being sent our way. And we have the capability to send spacecraft to other planets to see if uh, there's anybody walking, crawling, flying, or growing uh, on the nearby worlds. We've never before had that capability. What I'd like to do in this lecture is first to set a kind of uh, cosmic perspective on where we are, then to run through some of the factors involved in trying to assess whether there's life somewhere else, and in the course of that, say something about uh, some of the more interesting other objects in this solar system. And then towards the end, talk in uh, maybe a little detail about uh, the possibility of interstellar communication. Well, let me begin by asking you to uh, free your mind of all prejudice on the question of, is there life on Earth? Now, I know you may have some prior opinions on this subject, but imagine yourself uh, an inhabitant of, uh, say, the planet Mars. I suppose you, you don't look anything like the inhabitants of the planet Earth. Let's say you're a 14-foot diameter purple ellipsoid that floats two meters above the ground. You have 20 tentacles. Okay. Imagine there's a vast audience of 2,740 such ellipsoids. Um, then there's another purple ellipsoid up here on the platform. <laughs> and we're speculating on whether the morning star 
which is what the Earth would be from our point of view, us Martians, um, is inhabited. And the lecture probably would, would, would talk about uh, what a hostile environment filled with the poison gas, oxygen, and much too warm, and so on. But uh, we wouldn't be sure about such a priori judgments. We would want to actually look close up at this nearby planet. So if I can now have the first slide. Here is a photograph of the planet Earth that uh, could have been taken with a, an optical telescope on Mars of modest aperture. And uh, you will make out bright and dark areas on the planet. This can be focused a little bit better. Um, OK, that's good, I guess. So this brown thing here I'd call a bright area, and this dark blue thing I'd call a dark area, and there's this fuzzy white stuff, and we'd have to figure out what all that was. And as we'd watch, we'd uh, see the, the bright areas rotating under our field of view, and they'd appear over one limb or edge and disappear over the other, and we'd determine the period of rotation. We'd see the white stuff forming and dissipating, and we'd say, oh, those must be clouds of some composition. We're not sure exactly what. Um, we would determine the length of the day, the obliquity of the axis of rotation. By spectroscopy, we would determine all sorts of properties of the structure and composition of the planetary atmosphere. We would discover this poison gas oxygen. But surely, in a picture of this sort, we would not discover any sign of life. The next slide shows us what happens when we uh, send little unmanned, I think that's probably not the right word, spacecraft to the planet Earth. Um, we could get a resolution, an ability to discriminate fine detail, <coughs> in this picture of some tens of kilometers. And since the Earth is uh, half cloud covered, we would see a lot of beautiful cloud patterns. The meteorologists among us would be delighted, um, but uh, certainly anything about the habitability of the Earth would not clearly be answered at this resolution. Well, this resolution is already much better than the best ground-based observations of Mars. Okay, so already in looking at the Earth, we're doing better than the whole history of ground-based astronomy has done in looking at, uh, at Mars. The next slide is mostly just because it's pretty. Uh, there's this thing in the foreground, which you must ignore. Um, but uh, behind it, you uh, see this is pretty good resolution. Could be focused a little better. But the, the, uh, the basic point is that here, while the cloud cover is quite spotty, still not even surface detail, much less life is visible. Next slide. Shows us a uh, photograph of a region of the planet Earth, which may be familiar to some of you. Uh, this large X over here is uh, not on the planet Earth. That was on the Viticon. <laughs> that was on the Viticon faceplate of the uh, television camera that took this picture. Captain Kidd's treasure is not buried there. Um, now, this is a photograph of the uh, planet Earth at about one kilometer resolution. An ability to see fine detail about, uh, oh, six tenths of a mile across. Now, if you spend a lot of time looking at this picture, you will find no sign of life, intelligent or otherwise, in, say, this general region. Um, Washington, D.C. turns out to be lifeless. <laughs> Likewise, New York City, you can see Long Island jutting out there. Likewise, Boston, you can make out Cape Cod. 
And in fact, we have examined uh, thousands of photographs of the planet Earth at this resolution, and uh, we find no sign of life anywhere. No, not uh, London, Paris, Moscow, Peking, Sydney, Tokyo. None of those places. Why is that? It is because the reworking of the surface of the Earth by mankind, while very impressive to us who are little guys, is not yet on a large enough scale to uh, make major changes visible at kilometer resolution. When we improve our resolution, however, to about 100 meters, an interesting thing happens. Next slide. I don't know if uh, those of you in the third balcony can make this out, but at 100 meters resolution, the Earth's surface seems to crystallize into an array of rectangular patches, like a patchwork quilt. And uh, maybe you can make out this intricate pattern of squares and rectangles, which just fills this entire picture. Maybe it's a little bit clearer right up in here. And it just goes straight up all the way. And there are also a bunch of straight lines, which are highways. The, this patchwork quilt pattern at 100 meter resolution is due to the fact that human beings have a simultaneous passion for territoriality and Euclidean geometry. <laughs> Only one of those passions would not be enough. You have to have both of them to make the Earth look like a patchwork quilt. And uh, a large fraction of the Earth's surface, some percent over the whole globe, has this aspect at, uh, at 100 meter resolution. And of course, we could improve our resolution substantially and see smaller and smaller things. And eventually, we would see trees and automobiles, the dominant life form on the planet Earth, and uh, <laughs> then uh, a set of small bipedal parasites which live in the in inside of the dominant species. Uh, <laughs> which would be us. If you've ever flown over the United States at 2,000 feet, uh, it's very hard to see people and very easy to see automobiles. And it's clear that all the cities and the countryside has been constructed for the benefit of the automobiles. And uh, it's a very ready conclusion that they're the dominant life form. And there's some economic truth to that, I believe. Um, now, so far, we have just been talking about reflected light. But of course, we could also look at the Earth in emitted light. Uh, this is all sunlight bounced off the Earth. But the next slide. is a photograph taken in emitted light at night. And uh, that lovely drapery across the top is the aurora borealis. But all the rest of the stuff is the artifacts of human beings. These are the lights of large cities at night. And you can see that they. Uh, Nicely outlined, some familiar geography. That's uh, Florida. I guess that's Cuba. It's pretty bright in Cuba. You can see the uh, eastern seaboard here. You can make out uh, the western bank of Lake Michigan right here, Chicago. And I suppose somewhere in here, one of those dots is uh, Ames, Iowa. Who would guess what's going on in Ames, Iowa from looking at this picture? <laughs> now, these lights are bright in a picture of this sort, but they are sufficiently dim that it would be extremely doubtful whether were we on Mars with the full panoply of present instrumentation on the planet Earth, we could have detected uh, these lights. In any case, the point I'm trying to stress is that it is not trivial to detect even what we laughingly describe as an intelligent form of life on a planet. And uh, surely a planet inhabited, let's say, by microbes, which are quite respectable beasts after all, uh, would 
be impossible to uh, fully investigate for biology remotely. You have to go down there. And the critical point about uh, the resolution gradually improving and then suddenly the presence of life crystallizing out at you means that a planet may show no sign of indigenous biology until you've reached a certain degree of sophistication in your pursuit of that planet. Now, I would like to do a similar kind of exercise in perspective, but on a somewhat larger scale. Um, can I have the uh, overhead lights on for a moment, please? At um, Cornell, we've uh, programmed a uh, computer. It's an easy, an easy program to do. Uh, with the positions of the nearest stars, the three-dimensional positions of the nearest stars. And we then asked the computer to uh, draw us a star map. Now, a star map is a superposition of stars, bright ones far away from us, dim ones nearby, that together make some pattern that somebody thinks looks like a, a water carrier or a scorpion or a virgin. Um, I never can see any of those things up there. It's a psychological projective test in the sky. <laughs> and it tells us something about the state of mind of our ancestors who named the constellations. <laughs> but uh, nothing about the sky. Uh, that being the case, uh, one of the nice things about uh, uh, asking the computer to draw a star map is that you can ask it to draw a star map from some other place. And then, there will be new constellations, and then we can name them. <laughs> we can have a cosmic Rorschach test. Now, this is fun, but it also turns out to be instructive. So, the next slide. is a map drawn by the computer of the north circumpolar uh, constellations as seen from the vicinity of the sun. I think, yeah, good. So this guy, of course, is the north star. And uh, this thing that looks like a dipper is the big dipper. And I'm rapidly running out of constellations I personally recognize. Um, because if you fill up your mind with this sort of thing, you have no room for anything worthwhile. <laughs> but uh, I ask you to take a look at the bunch of stars uh, directly above my pointer, up there. And you can see a kind of up, down, up, down. Okay, it's kind of M. To some one of our ancestors, this looked like a, a lady sitting in a chair upside down um, named Cassiopeia. Okay, so if you can kind of bear in mind that random pattern of stars is a brightness uh, or magnitude scale to the right. I will now show you the same region of the heavens as seen not from the vantage point of the sun, but from the vantage point of the nearest star to the sun, which is actually a triple star system called Alpha Centauri. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, can we focus a little bit, please? Good. So here again is the North Star. Here again is the Big Dipper. How come it's the same constellation? Well, the reason is that Alpha Centauri is only four, a little over four light years from us. But these stars are much further than four light years from us. So by moving your perspective by just four light years, you haven't changed how you view those stars very much, and so you have the same constellation. And likewise, for all the other constellations, four light years is so small that the aspect doesn't change much. However, if you look at Cassiopeia now, you'll see, sure enough, there's an up, down, up, down. But then there's a little jag up. This star here is a bright one. You can see it's uh, 
first or zeroth magnitude, um, it wasn't in the sky from here. It's in the sky over there. How come? What is that star? It's us. That's the sun. OK, obviously it wouldn't be in our sky at night. That's the definition of night. <laughs> but those guys have a different sun, three different suns. And um, when it's night there, if it ever is, which turns out to be an interesting question, um, there is this bright star, which is visible. Now, you'll notice that there are other stars equally bright in uh, the sky of Alpha Centauri. It is not obvious from looking at this star map or glancing up at the sky if you happen to live on a planet of Alpha Centauri that there are planets going around the sun or that one of those planets uh, is inhabited by beings who speculate on astronomical and other questions. You could not tell from the vantage point of the nearest star. Now, the next slide is a computer printout not in the vicinity of the north circumpolar sky, but uh, in this broad range of intermediate celestial latitudes. Focus, please. Um, and I will not run through what all the constellations are for the simple reason that I don't recognize any of them. But all the ones you've heard of, and, you know, the zodiacal ones, the astrology freaks know about, they're all in there somewhere. Now, I will not ask you to compare this with the next one because there's too many points to bear in mind, but we've asked the computer to show us this same region of stars from the uh, vantage point of a star called uh, Tau Ceti, which is uh, 12 light years away. And there, there is some significant shift starting to happen. And so we were then able to, uh, to exercise our option to uh, invent new constellations. And I thought it'd be nice to have a constellation of the unicorn. Uh, but uh, there is one already, it turns out, in our sky called Monoceros. So I thought we had to clearly show that this wasn't a terrestrial kind of unicorn. So we should have a constellation of the six-legged unicorn. Um, and I asked my wife, who's an artist, to uh, draw one, and I thought she'd kind of do the leg arrangement that insects have, uh, two, two, and two. But instead, as the uh, next slide shows, she uh, did a very respectable three and three. Which, uh, <laughs> looks like a perfectly believable gallop. Now, um, in this field of view is the star, which is our sun. Where is it? By accident, it is this star. <laughs> now, imagine a debate in the Setian Academy of Sciences in which someone proposes that there is life going around the star which joins the unicorn's tail to the rest of him. Uh, I can imagine that there might be some skepticism about such a hypothesis. Well, you see, we have gone only 12 light years, and already the sun is very dim. Were we to go a few dozen light years, the sun would be fainter than fifth magnitude. It would be a star that would be invisible to the unaided human eye, only a few dozen light years away. But our Milky Way galaxy is some 100,000 light years across. So you can see there is only a tiny volume of the Milky Way galaxy in which you could see the sun. And beyond that, it simply fades and is lost in an array of 250 billion stars. The next slide, please, shows a typical region of the Milky Way galaxy. Every one of those little dots is a star. There's only, of course, a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are many places in the Milky Way galaxy. If we require an improbable event for the origin of life, for example, 
it may nevertheless be that there are so many places that even improbable events are going to happen. I will argue in a little bit that the origin of life is by no means an improbable event. Well, now to complete the perspective, if we can go to the next slide, there are no photographs of the Milky Way galaxy, because to have a photograph of it, you would have to leave it, and we don't know how to do that quite yet. But this is a photograph of the nearest spiral galaxy to our own, called M31. It's in the constellation Andromeda. All of these stars are in our galaxy, through which we are looking to see this other galaxy. This other galaxy is this guy. And you can't, in this picture, make out any individual stars from this galaxy, but you can see it as very bright. It is a collection of 250, about, billion stars, more densely concentrated to the center than to the periphery. If this were our galaxy, where would the sun be? The sun would be out about here, in the galactic boondocks. where the action isn't. <laughs> and it seems very unlikely that, uh, to take a interesting but uh, remote possibility, that a visitor from another galaxy would uh, say, when we, when we visit this one, the one place we must make a point of visiting is, uh, is <laughs> out here. Uh, it seems more likely that uh, just looking at this and not knowing any astronomy, you'd want to go in there. And in fact, it turns out that it's far and away the most interesting place. Well, this is just one galaxy. And uh, I would like to remind you that there are other galaxies. The next slide, please. This is a view out of the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, so there aren't a lot of our star is in the way, and we come upon a cluster of galaxies. That's a galaxy. That's a galaxy. That's one. That's one. That's one, or maybe two. That's one edge on. That's a beautiful one edge on way up there. There are, in fact, more galaxies than stars in this field of view. More galaxies beyond our Milky Way than stars within it, within this field of view. There are at least billions of galaxies, and possibly many more than that. So there are at least hundreds of billions of billions of stars in the universe that we know about, and we don't know everything after all. That's a very large number. That's more than 10 to the 20th, a one followed by 20 zeros. Now maybe I can have the lights for a minute. Is it possible that in 10 to the 20th stars, by accident, there is only one which has inhabited planets going around it, and that by the sheerest stroke of good fortune, we happen to live on that planet? Is it not more likely that uh, in this subject, as in so many others, the Copernican perspective applies? And we have on Earth but one example of a, an enormous array of cases. That life on Earth is a, in some sense, typical, though I'll say in a minute why it is not entirely typical, um, example of what happens when you leave cosmic matter alone for a few billion years and let the laws of physics and chemistry work. Now, what I'd like to do in this second segment of the talk is to ask the question, how many technical civilizations are there likely to be in the Milky Way galaxy? Now, this is, no one can answer this question reliably, at least no one I know. Um, but the act of trying to assess this question turns out to open up a wide range of interesting questions. So what I'm going to do is to go through the factors that you have to worry about to answer that question. So first of all, you have to worry about the rate of star formation, because if there's an awful lot of stars, if they're made easily, then 
there are many possible locales for life, and if otherwise, not. Well, as we've already indicated, there are enormous numbers of stars, hundreds of billions in our own galaxy. The galaxy itself is about 10 billion years old, so something like 10 stars are born every year in uh, the Milky Way galaxy. By the way, as compared to 200,000 human beings born every year. So if everything goes on at the present rate, there will soon be more human beings than stars, but uh, there will obviously be other rate-limiting factors that will come into play before that happens. The next question is, are there a lot of planets? I will be chauvinistic enough to restrict this discussion only to life that lives on planets and not life that lives in the centers of stars, for example, which I have difficulty imagining, uh, for example, because there are no molecules in the centers of stars. Well, there are various approaches to this question. As I've indicated, you cannot just look up in the sky and at a given star and say, well, do I see any planets going around it? Planets are intrinsically dim. Their reflected light is swamped out by the light of the star, and uh, you have no hope of doing it that way. There is a way of doing it by so-called gravitational perturbation techniques in which a dark companion, um, which you cannot see, nevertheless produces a wiggle in the motion of the parent star, which you can see. which a dark companion, um, which you cannot see, nevertheless produces a wiggle in the motion of the parent star, which you can see. And so by analyzing the subtle wiggles in the motions of stars over uh, periods of decades, it is in principle possible to uh, determine the presence of dark companions that you cannot see directly. The nearest single star to our own is called Barnard's star, and it has been reported to uh, have uh, one or two dark companions of Jovian mass that is comparable to the mass of uh, the planet Jupiter. Any object of smaller mass would not be detectable. Uh, the Earth going around even the nearest star would not produce uh, a detectable perturbation. It is just too insignificant. Only the most massive planet in our solar system could produce an appropriate perturbation even around the nearest star. There is some dispute on the reality of the uh, dark companions to Barnard's star, but what there is no dispute on is the fact that something like half of the uh, dozen or so nearest single stars have dark companions of mass ranging from about uh, the mass of Jupiter to about 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And the observational evidence looks very much as if planets are a dime a dozen. The, uh, there's another approach which is theoretical. And uh, let me just show you briefly uh, the results of a very interesting calculation by a scientist named Stephen Dole, uh, who imagines the solar system in the so-called uh, solar nebula stage when a cloud of interstellar gas and dust is contracting to uh, to form the sun and the planets. And uh, he allows only Newtonian physics. He injects uh, condensation nuclei, just little lumps of matter, which, when they collide with dust grains, the dust grains stick. When the condensation nuclei get larger than a certain size, they gravitationally attract gas. When two condensation nuclei uh, hit each other by chance, they stick and go off with the resultant velocity vector. 
And he lets the thing continue until all the gas and dust is used up. And then he asks, what do we see? Well, to orient you towards the results of his calculations, I must first show you a diagram of our own solar system. Next slide, please. Here we see the planets arrayed out in uh, units, a certain modest unit which astronomers have called an astronomical unit, which turns out by accident to be how far the Earth is from the sun. We uh, measure the universe by that standard. And uh, you can see, sure enough, the Earth is at one astronomical unit. Uh, and the inner little debris, thin, tiny, insignificant, rocky, and metallic planets like the Earth are all sitting in here at, uh, oh, roughly a third to one and a half astronomical units. And then <clears throat> the part of the solar system which really counts is out here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And they are, roughly speaking, at, uh, say, five to 30 astronomical units. So roughly speaking, the terrestrial planets live at about one astronomical unit, and the Jovian planets live at about 10 astronomical units. Uh, the masses are given up here in units of the Earth as one, another modest touch. So the Earth has one unit of mass. Uh, Jupiter has 317 times more mass in it than, than the Earth. Okay, so this is where we live. This is what it looks like. Um, the, the scale here is not linear, but logarithmic. Now, the next slide shows the result of a typical result of Dole's calculation. Each of these horizontal arrays is a different sequence of random injections of condensation nuclei. And each of these represents the final product. Well, in every case, he winds up with planets of roughly terrestrial mass at roughly one astronomical unit and planets of roughly Jovian mass at roughly 10 astronomical units. So if this calculation corresponds in the least bit to reality, it means that we have in our solar system one mild variation in a common pattern of arrays of worlds going around countless other suns, because the conditions in Dole's calculation are extremely general. Nothing special about our solar system in the calculation, and yet you wind up with something recognizably like our solar system. Uh, just for fun, I've, uh, since somebody sent me this slide, uh, the next slide shows a uh, hypothetical, very hypothetical as you can see. <laughs> um, but no one's taking in much of a risk with this picture. There we go. Uh, now that's backwards. Um, this is a painting, artist's impression, of a uh, photograph taken by a first interstellar probe to some nearby planetary system, and we will shortly see, in the dark of night, thank you, um, some other planet, and this one looks uh, pretty much like an Earth-like planet, the kind that you have great difficulty detecting from the vicinity of the Earth, but you have to go close to see. Well, I would suspect that uh, sending space vehicles to investigate even the nearest planetary systems is uh, many decades, perhaps more than a century, off. But there are methods that I've indicated for detecting big Jovian-type planets, and I think that's an exercise which will continue very uh, effectively. Lights, please. Well, if there are lots of planets, we have to then worry about two questions. One, are they ecologically suitable for life? And two, can the origin of life happen? For example, a planet which is extremely hot or extremely cold, you might uh, want to dismiss as a possible abode of life because the molecules will fall to pieces or the reaction rates will be negligibly slow. And uh, if the origin of life turns out to be difficult to require unusual conditions, then you might say, well, life elsewhere is, uh, is really not very 
uh, likely and therefore not very common. The next slide is one approach to the question of the origin of life. It is namely to look at the fossil record and examine the antiquity of life on Earth. Now, we're looking at microorganisms. The scale here is 10 microns or micrometers, a 10,000th of uh, a centimeter, so you cannot make it out with the naked eye. And uh, here is only 45 million years ago, so it's, this is very recent, and there are organisms of this sort all over the Earth. In fact, this room has many more of them in it than it does have human beings. Um, these guys are called bacteria and blue-green algae. Now, what's interesting is that there are bacteria and blue-green algae running back in this slide to 3.1 billion years ago, well before the Cambrian-Precambrian boundary. And more recent work since this slide was prepared shows such microfossils back to about 3.5 billion years ago. Now, a bacterium, or a blue-green alga, is a very sophisticated little beast. It's not just a bag of enzymes. It's beautifully architectured and uh, could not possibly be the first organism. It requires a long period of biological evolution for it to arise. But we don't have very much time because the Earth is only 4.6 billion years old. What's more, the first few hundred million years of Earth history is probably unsuitable for the origin of life because the Earth was busy being melted then. And from uh, Apollo return samples from the Moon, we discovered that the Moon was busy being melted then also, probably from the final accretion of the debris which formed the Moon. And that set of melting events ended about four billion years ago. And almost certainly, or at least I think very likely, uh, the Earth could not have escaped the same set of catastrophes that uh, the Moon suffered, and therefore the Earth was uninhabitable up until about four billion years ago as well. Well, bacteria 3.5 billion years ago, a lifeless Earth four billion years ago, but the bacteria need a long period of time for themselves to evolve, that means that the origin of life happened fast. An important conclusion. Six days was once a popular time scale, and uh, there is nothing in this data to exclude it, but uh, I would say a few hundred million years is certainly an outside upper limit. The origin of life could not have taken more than a few hundred million years. But a few hundred million years is a small fraction, like 10%, of the age of the Earth. So the origin of life took a period of time much less than the amount of time available. And that's another way of saying that the origin of life was likely, or probable, or easy. Now, there's another approach to this problem. And interestingly enough, it leads to the same conclusion. The next slide shows a typical photograph of the cosmos in color. Many of us are not used to imagining the universe as, as being rich in color, but that's because of uh, an adaptation in the human eye called the Purkinje effect, where you lose color information before you lose any other information. When you have the capability of uh, long exposure times with uh, telescopes then and color film, then the colors uh, come out. And uh, what is striking in virtually all such pictures is that the universe, as you see, is red. This is uh, a chemical, not a political statement. The reason, <laughs> the reason that so much redness shows up in such pictures is because of the Balmer emission and scattering of hydrogen. The universe turns out to be mostly hydrogen. Now, the Earth is not mostly hydrogen. And that means that we happen to live on a chemically anomalous hunk of rock. Now, 
if you want to go about investigating the origin of life, you had probably better simulate the conditions that were on the Earth at the time of the origin of life, rather than starting with the present conditions, which are themselves the product of life. For example, the oxygen and nitrogen, which make up 99% of our air, are produced by organisms. Okay, so the whole environment of the Earth has been worked over by biology, and we have to think a little bit before we can understand the conditions at the time of the origin of life. The key is the great abundance of hydrogen in the universe. If we look at a planet like Jupiter, we find it is made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. So is the sun, so are the stars, so are the other galaxies. Jupiter is so massive that even hydrogen cannot escape from its upper atmosphere. The Earth is sufficiently uh, small that hydrogen easily escapes. So if we had a hydrogen atmosphere early, we would have lost it. So the thing to do is to duplicate that hydrogen-rich environment in which you have methane instead of carbon dioxide, and water instead of oxygen, and ammonia instead of nitrogen. Supply some energy and see what happens. Next slide, please. Here is the setup of a typical experiment uh, in our laboratory in which such gases with hydrogen sulfide are mixed together in this reaction vessel, irradiated in the ultraviolet, simulating the sunlight on the primitive Earth, uh, circulated by a greaseless pump through this little bit of water, which is a very modest simulation of the primitive oceans. Um, and uh, we let the thing go for uh, some few days. The next slide shows the actual glassware uh, in the throes of being uh, irradiated. The gases are in here. You can see that this reaction vessel is colorless because all the gases that I talked about are colorless. And after a few days, the reaction vessel visibly changed its color. And the next slide shows the end of the experiment. You can see the reaction vessel filled with this brownish polymer. The uh, necktie is for color comparison purposes only. Now, what is it that has been made? In such experiments, we find made with very high yield, that is, very high efficiency, amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, and nucleosides, the building blocks of the nucleic acids. And the production rates are astonishing. Um, I'll give you two examples. In one experiment we did in which, uh, we didn't use ultraviolet light, in which we passed a, a single shock wave, a pressure pulse, through a mixture of such gases, we found that 38% of the ammonia was converted to amino acids. And just once through, amino acids is the preferred end product of that experiment. In these experiments, we can measure how efficient an ultraviolet photon is in producing such molecules, and then say, suppose that the same efficiency had worked in the primitive uh, environment of the Earth for a billion years, say, uh, before the hydrogen ran away and we make allowances for the fact that amino acids get destroyed as well as formed. And let's mix all the amino acids in the present oceans of the Earth. What do we have when we're done? What we have is a 1% solution of amino acids. That turns out to be the same as the amino acid content of Knorr's chicken soup, which uh, has been alleged to support life. But you must imagine the entire oceans of the Earth, pole to pole, surface to abyssal depths, covered with chicken soup. <laughs> that looks like not such a bad environment for the origin of life. And uh, the production rates are so astonishingly rapid that it is possible to make the first chemical steps very fast. And other experiments that have uh, been subsequently done show that uh, these simple molecules tend to polymerize into long chains. So you have things looking like proteins, things looking like nucleic acids. There are even experiments in which 
the things looking like nucleic acids reproduce themselves in the primitive environment, make identical copies, and it is clear that a major step to the origin of life can be done in a few weeks of the primitive Earth. And that's another reason why the origin of life looks to me pretty easy. Lights, please. Oh, um, sorry. Let's, let's come back to this, uh, to this slide. We can have the lights down. Could you just take a look at the color of um, this brownish polymer, which is uh, largely aliphatic straight chain uh, hydrocarbons? And uh, now let us look at the next slide which is a finer 10 photograph of the planet Jupiter. And uh, this is the great red spot, so-called because it's orange. But here, this brownish material is the characteristic coloration of Jupiter below these white ammonia cirrus high-lying clouds. The Jovian clouds at depth they live at uh, about room temperature, uh, live in quotation marks, of course, um, are colored brown. They have many of the optical properties that uh, the organic polymers produced in these experiments have. And it's not surprising, because the same gaseous molecules that we start with in trying to reproduce the origin of life on the Earth happen to exist in the atmosphere of Jupiter. We irradiate the atmosphere of Jupiter. We produce a powdery material, which seems to correspond to the clouds of Jupiter, well, indeed, it may. It may be that Jupiter is a vast planetary laboratory in pre-biological organic chemistry that's been going on for about five billion years and is therefore a very interesting place to go visit. Let me say a few words about uh, places to go visit. Um, Mars, the simplest thing to say about Mars is that there is nothing we know which compels us to believe it is inhabited, and nothing we know which compels us to believe that it isn't. It's another way of saying we don't know much about Mars, at least as far as biology goes. And uh, that's for the simple reason that I described at the beginning of this talk, that we haven't gone down to the surface of Mars and looked around. But we are about to. In less than a year, if all goes well, there will be uh, two lander spacecrafts called Viking launched towards Mars, and they will land on Mars in uh, the summer of 1976. July 4th, 1976 is a possible and therefore an inevitable landing date. <laughs> the next slide. shows us the Viking lander in Colorado, which is the most Mars-like environment we could find to test it in. Um, now, this is a very sophisticated laboratory, and in a certain sense it has eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth and hands, except all of those work uh, better than human seeing and hearing and tasting and smelling and feeling. Um, it uh, radios back what it finds to the orbiter overhead, which then relays the information to the Earth. It can also talk directly to the Earth. Um, here is a sample arm. It is, uh, let's see, how long? If I am the Viking spacecraft, I can reach uh, into the third row and pick up anybody that I find interesting there. Um, it uh, scoops up some Martian surface material. There's a lot of Mars is a very deserty kind of place. Retrieves it back into the spacecraft where it goes to a set of hoppers, and the samples are then sent to a, uh, an inorganic chemistry set and an organic chemistry set called the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, and three microbiology experiments based upon different assumptions. And, uh, the idea is to find out what inorganic material the Martian soil is made out of, what organic material might be there. It could be stuff left over from the early stage 
of the history of, of Mars when organic matter was being made, along the lines I just talked about, or it could be a biological origin. And then the microbiology experiments are to look directly for microbes. And then there are uh, two facsimile cameras. You can see this one because it has the American flag on it. And uh, there's the other. And they have optical properties almost identical to that of the human eye, uh, except they can see in the infrared and do another uh, bunch of fancy tricks. And uh, that is also, in a certain sense, a life detection experiment. Because if somebody walks by, we'll see him. <laughs> without making any assumptions on his biochemistry. Whereas the, uh, the microbial metabolism experiments all make certain assumptions on what the Martians are like or want to eat or happen to excrete or something like that. Whereas this, if you see something funny, you got him. <laughs> well, no one knows what, what Viking will find. It may find a lifeless planet. It may find a planet teeming with life. It may find a set of results which are ambiguous, and we'll have to debate on what the significance is and go check it out at a later time. But the critical point is that for the first time in human history, we're doing something about this question instead of just sitting around and speculating. So it's only another couple of years and we may, for the first time, know something about life on Mars. The one other place in the solar system I wanted to say a word about, next slide, please, is uh, a place you may not have heard much about. It's the biggest moon of Saturn called Titan. This is Saturn up here. Uh, all artists' impression, needless to say, this black band is the shadow of the rings on the body of Saturn. You're looking at the rings edge on. But this guy, is a vast, cloud-covered, dense atmosphere moon. It's very different from our moon. And the clouds appear to be composed of organic molecules. And uh, Titan is a lot easier place to get to than uh, Jupiter or Saturn. And it may be that uh, we will send entry probes into Titan before we send them into Jupiter or Saturn. Lights, please. Now, there are many places in the solar system which look possible as abodes of life. The origin of life looks dead easy. There seem to be huge numbers of planets. And therefore, I think a reasonable guess is that life is extremely abundant. But you remember our problem was not life, but intelligent life. And there we have a set of much more difficult questions, like, once you have life on a planet, and given a few billion years, do you develop an intelligent form? Like, once you have an intelligent form, does it necessarily evolve into a technical civilization capable of communication? Because uh, if there's a planet loaded with poets, but they don't have technology, I can't care about them because there's no way for me to know about them. So I might as well ignore them. They are operationally undefined. Whereas, those planets with uh, radio telescopes, even if those are awful fellows, those are the guys I can make contact with, so those are the guys I have to worry about. And then the final question I have to worry about is the lifetime of a technical civilization. Because uh, if civilizations destroy themselves shortly after reaching the technological phase, as uh, the recent history of the Earth does not exclude, <laughs> then you may have every previous step working fine, origin of life easy, evolution fast, technical civilizations emerge, and then everybody destroys themselves so that any given time there's nobody to talk to. <laughs> now, we are interested in the answer to this last question quite apart from our interest in interstellar communication. Like, we'd like to know, is it easy or hard to avoid destroying yourself after you uh, achieve technology? And certainly the uh, crises that are facing us, uh, 
ecological crises, pollution over population, nuclear war, exhaustion of mineral resources, and so long, dreadful litany, uh, those are very serious problems, all of which have emerged, for example, via uh, improved medical practice, from science and technology. Now, that doesn't mean that science and technology is bad, quite the opposite. But it means that this is a very powerful tool and it has to be used right. And what is not clear, to my mind, is that uh, there is the wisdom on the planet Earth to, in this critical moment when all the asymptotes are being reached, uh, to use science and technology properly. And it would be nice to know the answer to that question, uh, just for our own peace of mind, and also to be able to uh, assess the likelihood of there being other guys out there. In the case that there are a small fraction, let's say 1% of technological civilizations, which manage to avoid these catastrophes, then the numbers that I have been implicitly using in the discussion up to now work out to imply that in the Milky Way galaxy at the moment, there are something like a million technical civilizations more advanced than we. Now, that, that's a very iffy statement because we don't know a lot of the factors, particularly the last one, that go into it. But that seems to me to be a, a reasonable guess. Now, if there are a million technical civilizations, it is very easy, you only have to extract a cube root to calculate how close is the nearest one if they are randomly distributed. And the answer is a few hundred light years. Now that has some interesting consequences because uh, if they're a few hundred light years away, then it takes a few hundred years for radio or light or anything else to get to them, or longer, but not less. So for example, were we to say, uh, you know, suppose the message came and we were ready for it, and we immediately replied. Suppose they would say, uh, hello, earthlings, how are you? And we said, uh, fine, thank you, how are you? Well, that exchange takes 600 years. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not what you might call a snappy conversation.